What's up, guys? Dr. Gabrielle Lyon here with my best friend and longtime mentor, Dr. Donald Lehman. And today we have something very important to talk to you about. Arguably, everything that we're talking about is important, but this is a new paper out, and I've got it on one side of my screen, and obviously Don and I are on the other. And the title of the paper is Gut Microbiota Mediate the FGF2 Adaptive Stress Response to chronic dietary protein restriction in mice. I will start off by saying that that is a total mouthful, but <laughs> if you can get into the paper and get this, the concepts, and I'll link the paper below, um, it's really profound. And Don, you and I talked about some of these concepts five years ago, and you have put into play some really important aspects. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about why this paper came about and where you got the idea and really some of the highlights. And you guys will put this in a two or three part series because that's how important the paper is. Yeah, it's, um, it's a basic paper. I mean, it was done in rodents, so everybody has to realize it's proof of concept. But for years, I've wondered why vegetarians weren't more protein deficient. You'd sort of expect them to be based on all of the other research we've done. And one of my uh, past students and now colleagues, Suzanne Depkota, who's at uh, Cedar Sinai in California, as a, is a uh, expert in gut microbiome. And so we basically were discussing and theorizing that perhaps the type of diet actually causes the microbiome to change and help buffer that very low protein aspect. And so that's kind of the essence of it. What we showed was that the type of carbohydrates, the type of fiber, uh, specifically on a low protein diet, that your gut microbiome, the bugs in your colon, can actually adapt to that and help you um, conserve nitrogen, conserve protein. So there's a lot of individual parts to that we can talk about, but that's kind of the essence. It's sort of, our bodies have an amazing ability to adapt to different kinds of diets. And one of them appears to be at least in the short run to adapt to lower protein diets if you have the right kind of fiber. And that, that's really interesting. So just to summarize what Don is saying is, essentially this paper is a proof of concept and one, when one calls a paper basic, it really means basic science. So it's pretty heady, very technical, and that's what's considered the basic science, not that the paper is basic. And, right? I mean, yeah. so when, I, when I did my fellowship, I was actually very confused by that because everyone you know, in the meeting where it was talking about the basic science, and I'm thinking, oh my God, nothing in this room is basic. And now I can understand that. Yeah, but, if you pick it up and try to read the paper, you'll learn right away what I yeah. mean by basic. No, it, it's it, very right. fundamental. <laughs> right. Um, but this is a proof of concept paper. So it's not done in humans, it is done in rodents. And really, that, that's arguably the first step of determining if something kind of is viable if I'm not mistaken, is that it is done typically in rodent models. And what was so cool about this paper, and again, there's so many aspects to it, but in clinical practice, I see, and I don't see many, but over the years, I have seen some vegan and vegetarians really thrive in their diet choices. And Don and I would talk over the years, how is this possible? Because clearly we know that plant sources are deficient, you know, grossly deficient in, in many of the essential amino acids, but they seem to not have overt deficiencies, yeah. you know, and there has to be a reason that we just didn't understand. And so what this proof of concept in part is showing is that actually the gut and, and Don, please, the gut microbiome is actually um, breaking down in some way, right? The bacteria is actually sequestering or generating some of these amino acids. Is that accurate from what I'm it, reading from this? Yeah, it's, um, it's sort of developmental biology. A colleague of, and friend of mine, Steve Simpson in Australia is sort of known for sort of evolutionary biology, wrote a great paper known as the protein leverage hypothesis. And and one of the things that we've always thought about is the kind of carbohydrates and the carbohydrate protein ratios probably make a difference. And, and if you look at sort of evolution, one of the things we know is that ruminant animals 
cows and sheep and goats, uh, deer, uh, they have a gut that has bacteria in it that allows them to break down grasses and forages and the bacteria actually then make essential amino acids. It's one of the reasons that cattle are so important in our food supply is because they help us balance the availability of essential amino acids. One of the things I'm sure nobody's ever thought about is ultimately where do essential amino acids come from? You say, well, they come from the grocery store or whatever, you right. know, whole right. foods, right? But right. Ultimately, they have to come from somewhere, and the only where in the world, the only where in life that they come from is bacteria. So bacteria can make essential amino acids, so like they take nitrogen from the soil and fix it on the roots of plants, and the plants can make amino acids. Um, unfortunately, plants are making them to make flowers and leaves and roots, which aren't exactly the same right. as grains and hearts. Right. But a cow, a ruminant can take it and the bacteria there can take the grasses and things and make, balance it out with the essential amino acids. So the whole theory sort of came from that. And we said, well, if we feed a higher fiber diet, more plant-like things, you know, high quality vegetables and things like that, could we get the bacteria in a human gut to adapt to be a little bit more like a cow. And in, in fact, that's exactly what we found. We found species of bacteria that make amino acids would actually evolve. Gosh, so this, I mean, this really changes the paradigm of thinking. In it terms does. Of you, know, I, you know, what I would emphasize to people though is that these were short-term experiments. Right. Um, and so you're still dependent on a nitrogen source. And so in the short run, what we think we observed is these animals, because of fiber, became very efficient at reusing nitrogen from their body, waste products. Um, over the long haul, I think they will slowly lose muscle mass because they've got to keep getting this nitrogen from somewhere. But in the short run, it allows it to work. And I think in your practice and, and what we do, I think we would both agree that we see that young people, people between 20 and 40 get along pretty well as vegetarians, but once they get into their 40s, 50s, 60s, it's not so easy. And I think that's where the efficiency of recovery of nitrogen comes into it. I mean, it's just so fascinating. And you know, when you think about, could it be, you know, and this is purely speculation, could it be beneficial to go through cycles of, <laughs> eating a higher fiber, lower protein diet. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there would be benefit to it. All things we, all things we don't know. I, um, again, it's proof of concept, but you know, this paper demonstrates at least four different concepts that have never been shown before. And that sort of changes the game a little in how we think. And so now we'll have to take it from the animals and we'll have to look at it in a different way, but it kind of opens the door to asking new questions, one like you just asked. <laughs> right, and you guys have to check out this paper. I will link it below and I, I did put it in my newsletter, but it really is fascinating stuff. And I think, Don, that we should dive into some of the aspects of the paper and the hot topics or the hot points that are really just so profound. So yeah. I will stop the video here, you guys, just do a quick overview of it, as you can see, and then I will incorporate a couple more so you guys can learn. Okay.